The scripture reading this morning will be from Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 verses 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with the groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Ruin sinners to reclaim, hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood, hallelujah, what a Savior. A joyful faith because a glorious Lord. Good morning, church. I hope everyone has been having a great morning so far. I hope you've been encouraged by the songs that we've sung, by the prayers that have been offered before the Lord this morning, and as we shared in communion together. What a glorious day it is. Right now, I want you to think with me about the happiest moment of your life. I really want you to focus in on that thought. Get in your mind the happiest moment that you've ever experienced in your life. You knew this was coming. If it was a Texas fan, this was not your happiest moment. <laughs> it was a good one for me. I won't do that anymore. Happiest moment of your life. For me, it's July 21st, 2018. Uh, it was last summer on a very hot summer night. Uh, I married the woman of my dreams. Um, but you would think, okay, yes, everyone's happiest moment was when they got married. But it really wasn't the whole wedding thing that made me so happy. It was actually once all of that was done with, and I'm sure Amanda can attest to that. It was after we were leaving the reception and we got in my car that my friends had decorated with cheese balls and potatoes and balloons and wrote all over my mirrors. Uh, that was the happiest moment of my life. I asked Amanda, what is the happiest moment of your life? And she said the same thing, but I said, no, no, it wasn't. You can't steal mine. So what was your second happiest moment of your life? And it was going to uh, Harry Potter World in uh, Orlando, Florida for the first time. And I asked her why. And she said, well, because I've read all the books, I, I've seen all the movies, and I've seen all these things on the screen, and I visualized them in my mind. But for the first time in my life, I was able to see them for myself. And it was one of the happiest moments of my life. I asked Jacob, what was the happiest moment of your life? And he said, well, my wedding. Uh, but his second moment was uh, when he was baptized. And he said, that was the happiest moment of my life because for the first time in forever, I felt like I was genuinely saved. I asked Melissa McCullough, what is the happiest moment of your life? And it took her a little bit, but she said, probably at the birth of my children. And I'm sure you've seen the way she interacts with Madison. It was probably, she was probably more happy to have a girl than Hayden. Uh, but these are the happiest moments of these people's lives. And isn't it so ironic that the picture that you had in your mind and the moments that I shared with you from, from my experience, isn't it ironic that none of those moments happened in the midst of adversity? That there was... No suffering that was a part of those stories. That we weren't going through anything that brought hardships to our lives. But they were all happy, adversity-free moments. I want to suggest to you this morning that there is a way that as Christians, we can find joy in adversity. As you can tell from my face, I am currently facing adversity from the sun... Um, and I'm looking like Bob the Tomato from VeggieTales. Um, it's a good show. Low-key still a fan. I'm grown, but it's still a good show. Um, but as Christians, we can find joy in adversity. In our continued series that we started last week titled Joyful Faith, uh, Jacob and I have decided to work through the book of Philippians. And throughout Philippians, you see a joyful faith being manifested through Paul. 
Uh, last week we studied together that there is joy in community and today we will see through verses 12 through 26 that we can find joy in adversity. So if you have your Bibles, turn along with me uh, and let's look starting in verse 12 of Philippians chapter 1 and see first of all that adversity promotes the progress of the gospel. Paul writes, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances has turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment and the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Have you ever found yourself in a tough situation? And things just weren't going your way and, and someone told you that things were going to be better on the other side of things. Uh, maybe it was because you were having to break up with a girlfriend or a boyfriend when you were younger. Uh, maybe it was quitting something that you liked. Maybe it was quitting an addiction or maybe it was a change in your diet. But no matter what you were going through in that moment of affliction and when you were facing adversity, you're hurting and it stinks, and, and you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Now, Paul is not having to break up with a girlfriend or, or going through a diet change or anything like this. Notice, Paul is in prison. That my circumstances... Well, what are your circumstances, Paul? Paul's in prison. And he's chained up to a guard. And he's in prison because of his proclamation of Jesus. But notice how he handles this current adversity. He recognized that be because of this current adversity that he is facing, he is actually promoting the gospel more than he, w he was when he was not in prison. Paul understands that these circumstances he's facing are actually letting him be a better evangelist. Paul is spreading the gospel even while he is chained up in a prison cell because the news of his faith has spread. A joyful faith even in the midst of adversity. And isn't it so amazing and so interesting that even though you may be facing adversity and it may really be dragging you down, that you have an opportunity to use it to promote the progress of the gospel? The prisons of our life can often become places of great opportunity and great ministry. And I've seen through your examples, through your lives, when you all have faced adversity, what this looks like lived out. Uh, for example, Winston, I have to commend you in while well, you were going through your chemo treatments, the Facebook posts that you would make. You had non-Christian friends who would see those posts. And they knew that there was something different about you. And that in the midst of adversity, we have the opportunity to promote the progress of the gospel and how we react in certain situations matter and word travels quickly. Notice what Paul goes on to say in verse 13. So that in my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout where? The whole praetorian guard and to everyone else. The men who are around Paul know exactly why he is in prison. Everyone knows why Paul isn't in prison. And they also know that he's joyful about it. These guards would have been exposed to Paul's testimony as he shared it with them personally and as they listened to him share it with others. And apart from his imprisonment, there's probably no way that he was going to reach the men in the Roman area, in the palace of Rome, if he wasn't in prison. Notice, 24 hours a day, he would have been chained to an officer. Every six hours, the guards would change their shift. So that means Paul had four prospects for salvation every day of the week. Now let's do some math. Paul is in prison for two years. So that means Paul would have been able to engage with almost 3,000 men who were Rome's top military personnel. And we know for a fact that he converted some of them. Because at the end in Philippians chapter 4 verse 22, he writes that all of the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Having a joyful faith in the midst of adversity 
can promote the progress of the gospel. Paul took advantage of the opportunity that was placed in front of him to promote the gospel. I want us to consider our lives for a moment. How many doctor's visits do you go on? How many times do you have to visit the dentist? How many times do you go into work and sit down at the same chair every day next to the same people? And we wouldn't call all of these things adversities, but they're definitely opportunities to promote the gospel. And you have the opportunity to share your faith, share your testimony with those who have no idea who God is. Being in prison didn't cause Paul to be quiet, and we should inherit his joyful faith and be loud. But not only has Paul persuaded people to become Christians, notice what happens here. He's actually encouraged the brethren by his time in prison. That they are now trusting in the Lord because of his imprisonment, and they have far more courage to speak the word of God Notice that la- those last two words, without fear. Does that mean persecution is not going to happen? No. Does it mean that they may be thrown in prison if they are proclaiming the word of God? Yes. But notice, they want to. They want to experience adversity. They are so bold, they are so courageous that they want to be in Paul's footsteps. They want to speak the word of God. And through Paul's example, they don't care what happens to them because they realize they can have a joyful faith even in the midst of adversity. And may we be more like these brethren. May we have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. You know, we are so lucky that we can proclaim the word of God here in peace. That in the United States, we are so lucky that we have free speech and we have the opportunity to say things that we feel passionate about. And why is it that we're so scared to make a simple Facebook post about our faith while these brethren are here laying their lives down for the gospel without fear? Why are we so scared to talk to our neighbors about our faith? Why are we so scared of facing adversity from others if we tell them about our faith. We need to develop a joyful faith that causes us to speak about the Word of God and tell others about our glorious Lord even in the midst of adversity and even if that brings upon adversity. Because when we have a joyful faith, adversity can promote the progress of the gospel. Second, I want us to look at verses 15 through 18 and see that adversity proves the character of our friendships. Verses 15 through 18, Paul writes, Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. When things go bad in your life, and you're in your low places, you really find out who your true friends are. I don't know what situations everyone has been put through in this life, but I know everyone here has gone through a rough patch of some kind. And we all have friends that you know you can count on no matter what happens. Because in the past they've proven to be your true friends and you can continue to count on them. But also you may have experienced a time where you were in your low place and, and you really felt like you could count on these certain people to help you out. When in fact, they left you out to dry. And maybe even they caused your current hardship to be worse than it actually was and they threw you under the bus or they they started giving false rumors about you. And that hurts. I've been there before and I've experienced that before and that's no fun. You don't ever want to be a part of that. But experiencing adversity can prove the true character of our friendships. Now notice what happens with Paul. Paul's experienced this himself. And there's two different groups of people. Number one, the first group, there are those who are preaching from goodwill. They're doing it out of love because they know that he's appointed for the progress of the gospel. And they're doing it from pure motives. 
And also we have to understand and remember that the reason they are now preaching and proclaiming the word of God is because Paul himself gave them more courage to do it. They are now more bold to speak the word of God because of Paul. These men want Christ to be proclaimed. They show Christ in their life and they are trying to encourage Paul by following in his footsteps. But notice there's another group of people. In this group of people, I have the wrong font, or I had a font downloaded on my computer, and we don't have up here, so that's why it looks a little weird, so I apologize for that. But this other group of people are preaching from envy and strife, and they're proclaiming Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, and they are thinking to cause Paul distress while he's in prison. These brethren are doing certain things so that the Philippian brethren would tell Paul that they were doing them. Proclaiming Christ has now become a competition for these certain brethren. Their mindset was that they needed to do everything that they could to draw all this attention that has been set on Paul and draw it to themselves. Their focus was for people to follow them while Paul's focus was to get people to follow Christ. Notice the difference there. Paul could have went on and on and on about what these brethren were doing and, and how they were so wrong. But notice because of his joyful faith, all Paul cared about was that Christ is being proclaimed. He rejoices in the fact that even though these brethren are going against me and they're causing me problems, I don't care about that because they, at least they're proclaiming Christ. Notice, and in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. People may have evil motives behind the things that they do to you. And it's not your responsibility to search out those evil motives. It's not your responsibility to destroy, destroy those brethren. Your responsibility, Paul's responsibility, and my responsibility is to proclaim Christ. And if we are doing that, when people prove that their characters are off and we can't rely on them, we know that at least Christ is being proclaimed. And if they're not proclaiming Christ, we have the opportunity to continue proclaiming Christ no matter what may happen to us. Adversity proves the character of our friendships. Continuing on in verses 19 and 20, we see that adversity... Ad, adversity... Adversity sparks growth in our life. Notice what Paul says. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Adversity separates people. It makes some people better, and it makes some people bitter. And as Paul looked at adversity, he obviously let it make him better. As Paul looked at his time in prison, he saw it as another method of bringing him to his ultimate goal of spiritual maturity. Paul was confident that this adversity that he was facing was going to spark growth in his life. His joyful faith caused him to see an opportunity for growth even in the midst of adversity. Now, with this text, I want us to observe three things that helped Paul achieve his goal of spiritual maturity. And we're going to look at those same three things that helped Paul. And we're going to notice that those same three things are the exact same things that are going to help us reach our spiritual maturity. First, we see that Paul was able to reach spiritual maturity through the prayers of his friends. Paul had people praying for him and he was extremely thankful for that. Paul had asked these people to pray for him because he recognizes how powerful prayer is. I, I have a pet peeve and it's when people are struggling and uh, someone walks up to them and asks, well, what can I do for you? How, how can I help you in this time of adversity or these times of hardship that you're facing? And that person responds, well, the least you can do for me is to pray. 
You notice why I don't like that? Because the most I can do for you is pray for you. The most beneficial thing I can do for you is to pray for you. Because when I'm praying for you, I am personally lifting you up to the Father in prayer. And I am asking Him to specifically exalt you at this time and help you through that hardship. Praying for someone is the most that we can do for someone. And can you imagine how many people were praying for Paul while he was going through this time? Notice that this helped him reach his level of spiritual maturity. And I absolutely loved what Jacob challenged us last week to do. And that's to pray for someone who you know needs your prayers. Not only pray for them, but write them a message to encourage them. Let them know that you are personally lifting them up in prayer before the Father and that you are asking God to exalt them. Do that. Church, we need to pray for each other. And if you need encouragement and if you need prayers from someone in the congregation, don't be afraid to ask. Don't feel like that's the weak thing to do because in fact, that's the strongest and the best thing that you can do is to let the congregation pray for you. Let your friends and your family pray for you. Because the prayers of God's people can help us achieve a joyful faith even in the midst of adversity. Notice the second thing that helped Paul, and that was the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The Spirit is the reason for strengthening of Paul's faith and his courage. I had Maverick read Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27 for us, and I'm going to read it again. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Paul understands how powerful the Spirit worked throughout his life. He writes in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 16 that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his Spirit, the inner man. Just as Paul believed that through prayer and the Spirit he would be delivered, we too are aided in that same way. When we are facing adversity, when we are experiencing hardships in our lives and, and times are tough and we don't know what to do or we don't know what to say when we are praying, we need our brothers and sisters in Christ to pray for us and we need the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God gives us a strength and it helps us achieve a joyful faith. And the third thing that helped Paul was his personal dedication. Notice his words, to my earnest expectation and hope. Paul was confident that he was going to get through this adversity and he was actually going to let it make him into a better person. And when we find ourselves in tough situations, we have to have the personal determination to get out of this situation and be more like Jesus. And after these adversities... You don't become more like Jesus on accident. You have to have a personal dedication to make that happen in your life. You have to approach every challenge in your life with the personal goal of becoming more like Jesus on the other side of things. We need to have a more personal dedication to have a more joyful faith. Now notice that's what helps Paul. That's what helped Paul achieve his goal of spiritual maturity. That's what's going to help us achieve our goal of spiritual maturity. But now I want us to look at what Paul does not let adversity do. First of all, Paul does not let adversity put him to shame. Paul does not let this adversity put him to shame and it teaches us a lesson that we need to understand. Our problems and the adversities that we face do not define who you are. Your hardships, your moments of weakness, your low points, that is not who you are. But how you respond to those things do. Don't let the hard situations that you face keep you from having a joyful faith and hinder the growth in your life. Rather, respond well and let it spark growth. 
in your life. That's what a joyful faith does. Second, adversity does not take away his boldness. Notice he says with all boldness. But with that in all boldness. If something is all something, that means that there is nothing lacking. There is no boldness lacking in Paul because of the outer things that are trying to come in. With all boldness. He doesn't let this adversity stop him from, from proclaim, proclaiming Christ. There are those who I'm sure were questioning Paul as to why he was still proclaiming Christ when he saw the constant persecution he was facing. And that's where Paul had the opportunity to tell others that this life is so much bigger than ourselves. That we have amazing opportunities to claim to others that the Christian life is so much bigger than the moments of adversity and there's an eternity that is empty of adversities waiting for us on the other side. And a joyful faith will recognize that and will encourage others to join you there. And then the last thing that adversity does not do is it does not push Jesus away. Paul does not let this adversity push Jesus out of his life. In fact, it lifts Jesus even higher. Paul has grown so much in his faith that he is joyful whether, notice this, whether by life or by death. A joyful faith because he knows that he has done all things to the glory of God. And can you say the same thing about yourself this morning? Are you okay with dying right now for the cause of Christ? Are you okay with living in persecution every day from here on out because of your belief in Jesus? Don't let adversity put Jesus out of your life. Rather, let it lift him up. When we have a joyful faith, adversity sparks growth in our life. And our final point this morning, as we look at verses 21 through 26, we'll see that adversity purifies our motives. Paul writes, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, that will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose. But I am hard pressed from both directions. Ha having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and join the faith, so that your proud confidence in me through Christ Jesus, through my coming to you again. We all have things in this life that we live for. We set goals for ourselves. We set goals for our families. We have bucket lists. We want to go to certain places. We want to experience certain things. And just like us, Paul had goals. But notice, Paul had one main goal. Even if he wasn't able to do the things that he wanted to do, which we know he couldn't, Paul had one main goal. And that was to live for Christ. To live faithfully and to do all things to the glory of God. And as a result of Paul doing that, he would find himself receiving the victor's crown and spending an eternity with the Father. And because of Paul's joyful faith, notice he finds himself in a dilemma. To live is Christ and to die is gain. He's having to face this dilemma here. But notice that neither one of these two options is a bad option for him. Have you ever had to choose between two things before? Uh, maybe it's going to a restaurant uh, for your anniversary or for your birthday. Or it's uh, moving to a new state and, and you can't decide which city to move to. Or it's a new job. And, and both of those options sound so good. You know, I... I want to go to Bartlett's for a good steak, but I could also go here for a good steak. Well, they're both good options. It's, it almost comes down to a, a flip of a coin, right? But then you've also been a part of those experiences where there was one option that very heavily outweighed the other, right? And it's easy to find out what choice you're going to make. Paul's not experiencing that. Paul is an experience, he's experiencing a win-win 
situation. So he goes on to explain why this is so hard for him. Notice, if he were to stay, or if he were to go with the Lord, it would be very much better. He says, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Paul, ever since his conversion, has lived his life entirely for Christ. He's suffered persecution for the cause of Christ. He's, he's brought many souls to Christ. He's worn down and he's ready to go be with the Lord. And that may be you this morning. And that's okay. Because life is hard. And our bodies get old and our, our bodies wear down. And we begin to suffer. But what Christ has on the other side of things is very much better. And it's attractive and it's something that we should long for. And a joyful faith causes us to hunger and thirst for an eternity with Jesus. And that's what Paul is experiencing here. But notice the second option that he goes on to choose. And that second desire is to live on in the flesh. Notice the benefits for Paul. I mean, fruitful labor for him. It also means that is more necessary for their sake. And we see in verse 23, I know that I will remain and continue with you all. But notice, even though this is Paul's option, he's not going to waste his time here on earth. He's going to live his life in such a way that it will bring progress and joy to others in their faith. Does your presence here on earth do that for others? Are you bringing progress to people's faith? Are you bringing joy to people's faith? Are you helping others excel in their faith? Are you being a stumbling block? Are, are you someone who just mopes around and, and has a frown on your face and you look like you'd rather be doing anything else? That's not a joyful faith. Paul has such a joyful faith that in the midst of adversity, others are so proud of him and have extreme confidence in him that no matter what he's faced in the past, no matter what he's facing now, no matter what he's facing, going to face in the future, that he's going to do all things to the glory of God and they are going to look up to him and he is going to strengthen their faith even more. Do others look at you that way? Is your faith so obvious that others develop confidence in you and look up to you when they handle adversity for themselves? We have to understand that our influence as Christians is so important. And it can be such a powerful tool. And we have the perfect opportunity when adversity comes to be like Paul and experience his sufferings in a joyful manner. A joyful faith lets adversity purify our motives. This morning, do you have a joyful faith? Do you have hope and confidence in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Are you a happy person? Do you trust that men like Paul suffered well for some reason? Uh, when adversity comes your way, don't you want there to be something much bigger on the other side of things? Don't you want your life to be more than just trials and heartaches and pain? Well, there's a greater life on the other side of things if you act upon it this morning. God wants you to be saved. He wants you to have hope in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. He wants you to be baptized. He, he wants to forgive you of your sins. And this morning, won't you answer that call? Christians, let's be joyful and show others that being a Christian is the greatest thing that we can be in this world, even in the midst of adversity. If you need to come forward and put Christ on in baptism, or you need to come forward and ask for prayers of the congregation, why don't you do so? All together we stand and as we sing.